Good afternoon. Today is January 11th, 1999. We're here at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Massachusetts, and continuing with our Veterans Oral History Project, we are in the midst of beginning an interview today with Stanley B. Cohen. Good afternoon, Mr. Cohen. Good afternoon. Could I ask you your current address? In Natick, Massachusetts. How long have you lived there? 47 years. And do you mind my asking you your age? I'm 74 years of age. And you are married? Yes. Your wife's name? Irene. And children? Three. And any grandchildren? Three. A little background before we start the actual interviewing about your veterans services. Uh, where were you born? Winthrop, Massachusetts. And were you raised in that area? Uh, Winthrop, Mattapan, and Hyde Park. And what brought you to that area? What did your parents do, your dad in particular? My mother was a housewife, my father was a dental salesman. So did he do a lot of traveling? Quite a bit, saw very little of him. And where did you go to school? I went to school in Mattapan and Hyde Park High School. Having gone to Mattapan High School, did you have a sense that soon after that you would be going into the service, or was it an unplanned? Well, when I was in high school, the Boston High School had what they called the Boston School Cadets. I don't know whether they still have them or not. And uh, we took uh, military drill uh, under the uh, guidance of uh, Reserve, Marine, Army, and Naval officers. And that happened at Mattapan High? No, Hyde Park High School. Hyde Park High. Only took place in the high schools. So was it sort of a pre-ROTC type of program, do you, would you well, describe I, it? Well, I suppose you'd call it that, but I certainly, we didn't think we were ever going to have to use the little training that we got at that time. We're all, we're only 14, 15, and 16 years of age. Did you do this after school? Oh no, as part of the school curriculum. Took place rather than gym, the girls took gym and we took milli uh, drill. And what year did you graduate from high school? I graduated in 1942, June. And was that Mattapan High? Hyde Park High School. So you started out with Mattapan and then moved? No, Mattapan was part of the Boston School District. Okay, I'm sorry. Hyde Park High was our school. After high school, what did you do? After high school, I um, worked uh, in the Four River Shipyard. War had been declared for four or five months, and then I uh, went into the military. Did you volunteer, or were you called up? I volunteered. I uh, first went into the Merchant Marine Cadet Corps. And where did that take you? That took me to uh, Great Neck, Long Island. Do you remember anything about that that sort of sticks in your mind? Oh yes, the uh, the uh, camp wasn't the camp. The uh, school, basic training school, was at uh, the Chrysler Estates on Long Island Sound. That was a beautiful building the estate itself. Of course, when we got there, they had uh, four or five uh, army, uh, what did they call them, barracks. Uh, most of us slept in barracks. Uh, I had the good fortune of sleeping on a training ship with 50 or 60 other young men, and we slept in uh, hammocks. And that was out in the harbor? It was anchored, uh, it was moored right alongside a uh, a pier, which was part of the uh, installation. Was this sort of your basic training? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Very quick basic training, about six weeks. Six weeks. And then after that, what did you do? After that, we were assigned to uh, our ship, uh, Liberty Ships, and uh, I was sent to Portland, Maine, and we took her, uh, her name was the Edward Preble, I believe. How do you spell the last name? P-R-E-B-L-E. And it was a Liberty ship? Liberty ship, brand new, just launched. 
Did you have friends that joined the military with you or around the same I time? I had uh, some, who, and I had one young man who uh, went in when he was uh, 17, and he uh, wound up as a seaman on the, uh, well, what was her name? The destroyer that uh, was sunk in the North Atlantic, the Reuben James, and they lost many, many people. He survived, fortunately. After basic training and you went on the Everett Preble, explain why you call it a liberty ship. Well, they were, uh, we, we built, I say we built, uh, 7,000 during World War II. And uh, they were named the Liberty Ships because, uh, I, I don't know why they really chose that name. Uh, they were a very basic cargo transporting vessel. Uh, they did about 12 knots. Uh, and until they, uh, we reached a point where they, we could build a better vessel, which they called the, uh, they were called the, um, Strange how you forget, isn't it, huh? Well, they built, the, the, the Liberty ship was, was propelled, her main engines were turbines. No, I beg your pardon, not turbines, reciprocating engines. They had a three-stage reciprocating engine. And when we got to the point where they could build better vessels, they built them with turbines as propulsion. And they went 17 or 18 knots, which meant we could move people, equipment faster and uh, more efficiently. And during this time, was there any specialty on the ship that you were involved with? Yes, I was a cadet engineer. And that would be in the lower compartments of the ship? I was, in the, I, I was uh, my training was uh, strictly with the uh, engines, the propulsion equipment of, of a Liberty ship. What did you like about that? Oh, I liked it all. <laughs> The only part I didn't like was getting seasick, but that's part of being a sailor. Did you get used to the seasickness after a while? Uh, there are strange seasickness. Some men I knew that went to sea for 20 or 30 years would, uh, would get sick when the ship uh, rocked. Others would get sick when the ship heaved. And uh, you eventually got used to it, two or three days usually. Did anyone teach you any tricks on how to bypass seasickness? Well, we try to, uh, I think, eat crackers. We eat a lot of crackers, as I remember. Not eating too much, as I remember, either. Sure. So when you would go out on this ship, where would you go? Well, when we took this ship, we took her first to uh, Philadelphia, and uh, she was loaded with uh, military equipment. Uh, bombs, gasoline, planes, tanks, and we took her to uh, North Africa. So from Philadelphia to North Africa with all of this equipment, how long did it take you to get there? It took approximately, as I recall, about uh, 25 to 30 days. Was this your first trip basically overseas? Yes, trip, overseas? that's correct. Yes, it was. Was there an excitement about that? Oh, certainly. In what way? Uh, well, we traveled in convoy, and at that period of time, uh, we were subject uh, once or twice to uh, submarine warnings. I saw one or two uh, ships disappear. We, uh, when we got in North Africa, we visited the ports of uh, Orion, Philipville, Azu, and uh, they were nightly attacks by uh, the German Luftwaffe. And at this point, how old were you? I was 18. How, how does something like seeing a ship disappear or seeing German planes? Well, seeing a ship disappear with people on it is something you never forget. There's one minute it's there and the next minute it's not there. And uh, no one stops. You just, keep you just can't stop. It's, uh, it's fate, I guess, that decides where you are when something like that happens. A number of other uh, veterans have talked about zigzagging. 
that they might convoys did. Convoys. Yes. So do you remember that effect with your ships? No, I don't remember that. Mm -hmm. That doesn't stay with me. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the uh, second trip across uh, on another Liberty ship, her name was the Benjamin Franklin. Uh, at that time, we had advanced far enough to uh, have what they called Jeep carriers. And uh, they had six or eight fighter escort planes, I believe they were. And they would circle a convoy during the day and protect us during the day. And we saw, you never saw submarines then. Uh, at night, they would uh, take off and take care of themselves with their escort. And the next morning, they were there again, and it was always great to see them. So in the evening, did you find you were more in tune to danger, or did you find that it was... There well, it was, was more, you were more in tune to danger in, in, during the evening, but I don't think anyone dwelled on it. I know we didn't dwell on it. You went about your duties, and and you carried on like you normally would. Now, I don't think that I can recall ever dwelling on it. And when you're on this ship, did you have time on, time off? Yes. What was a typical couple of days like? We worked, uh, we were, were part of the Merch Marine. Uh, we weren't considered veterans at that time. Fortunately, that changed. Uh, we worked four on and uh, eight hours off. And uh, during our tour of duty, uh, you know, when we were down the engine, we did whatever the engineer assigned us to do, the engineer on duty, which ranged from getting into the bilges of the ship to uh, all the various duties, taking care of boilers, oiling the engines, checking bearings. The uh, loneliest part of that experience, as I recall, was when we had to go down what they call the shaft alley, which went from the engine room where there was a watertight bulkhead, and the shaft was probably a couple hundred feet long, maybe, probably 18 inches in diameter. It went out to the stern of the ship where the propeller was, and these uh, turbines, these shafts rested on bearings, and you had to make sure that those bearings were well lubricated and. Uh, taken care of us so they didn't seize up and cause any problems or damage to the shaft. And was it a type of area that only one person could go down at a only time? Only one. And if you ever took a hit there, you would uh, see you later. Goodbye, sweet Nellie. So if you had to go into the shaft area and make sure these bearings were, as you said, well-oiled, from start to finish, how long would you be gone and by yourself? Probably 15, 20 minutes, as I recall. Did everyone feel discomfort having to do that? I would think so. Mm -hmm. I would think so. I, there were some things that, uh, you know, I would think so. Mm. So you were on the Ben Franklin for how long? Well, I was on both ships for approximately two and a half months, I'd say. And uh, we, uh, what I do recall is when we across the Atlantic, and before we went into the Mediterranean, we stopped at Gibraltar, where they'd formed the convoys going into the, uh, into the Mediterranean Ocean. And uh, Gibraltar was quite a place. Uh, there were hundreds of ships in that harbor. And uh, they would, uh, in the evening, uh, the swimmers, I don't know whether they were of a, the Axis powers, whether they were Spanish or Italians or Germans, would uh, have underwater swimmers and they would plant mines on the ships at night. And uh, some ships would take a hit from them. And to uh, prevent this, the English had uh, many uh, motor launches. I, I wouldn't call them speedboats, I call them motor launches. And from dawn till dusk, uh, or rather I should say from dusk till dawn, uh, they would uh, scurry through that harbor dropping jet charges at maybe one every two minutes, one, one every, they never, you never knew, but you could hear them, you could feel a concussion. And if uh, they hit a swimmer, it would either kill them or uh, cause them to become unconscious and they'd drown. And, Occasionally, you see one or two floating on the top, you know. 
And you would hear this during the evening? During the nighttime hours only. So if you were having, uh, uh, after a long day, time to, to, to hit the sack, so to speak, you really couldn't sleep well. Well, I don't, I wouldn't say that. I think, I think we slept pretty well. So you got used to yeah, these it's, noises. It's, you, you knew what was, what was going on, and you, you carried on your duties, and I, I, don't, I don't ever recall losing any sleep or anyone else losing any sleep. What, what kind of sense did you and your, your fellow shipmates feel when they would see a body, knowing that this was also a young person, but that it maybe saved your lives? Better them than us. Mm -hmm. Uh, Gibraltar itself was a uh, quite a place. It was very heavily, heavily fortified. Uh, I, I walked to the top of that that rock, if you if you will, and it was quite a sight from the top of it. Uh, the uh, it was all military except during the day when they would allow uh, the Spaniards across the causeway and they ran the few concessions that were there. And in the evening, they were uh, compelled to go back uh, into Spain. The, uh, I recall the uh, range, the, uh, how they got water. They had uh, huge cisterns, and they would uh, funnel the water when it rained down these, I used to call it a culvert, into the cistern where they'd store the water. And that's the way they got their fresh water. So you would have some time off the ship, and you could go? Oh, yes. Do you remember any kind of scene or uh, village life that stuck in your mind at all? Not in Gibraltar. No. And uh, in North Africa, the ports, uh, those ports were badly damaged, and uh, you'd walk around, and but there was really not too much to see. I think most of our time we got off, we went into the uh, found a beach and went swimming. We're all young men, and that's what uh, you know, we went swimming. What was the weather like over there? And, and what time of year was this again? Well, the first trip was in the, uh, was more hot in the summer. And the second trip was in the fall. The, uh, the first trip, I recall, I met a, uh, an English officer and he took me out to uh, one of the English military field hospitals. And I saw many of the English uh, folks there that were pretty well shot up. And the second trip, uh, as I say, it was in the winter. It was in October, November, very rainy. And that's when I decided I didn't want to go in the army because those poor guys were sleeping in the mud and we always had a bunk. Mm -hmm. that, that's what decided my, me to go in the Navy. Mm -hmm. So when did you go Navy? I left the uh, Cadet Corps in uh, uh, March of... Uh, February or March of 44, and I uh, went in the Navy in uh, June of 44. And you had said earlier that as merchant marines, you initially were not thought of as? Not considered veterans. Uh, and that, uh, of course, that was a struggle that uh, took place. It, we would have been, the, mer the merchant mariners would have been considered veterans if Franklin Roosevelt had lived. That was one of his uh, things he wanted. He spoke of that, as I recall. And that took place uh, in 1988, I believe the year was. That, uh, and of the 200, approximately 250,000 merchant mariners, there was approximately 100,000 left. And so this acceptance in 1988 was retroactive to World War II, prior to World War II? Not prior, during the war, during yes. The war. Yeah, they so gave us veteran status. They, it was acceptable. They, um, of course, I had that anyway because I went in the Navy, but there were many guys who stayed in the American service and it didn't go in the Navy. So that allowed them to be uh, buried in the National Cemetery and uh, whatever else the veterans' benefits Other were. Other benefits. Yeah, still are. Going to these different areas of the world um, as a young man from the Hyde Park area, what, what do you think were some of the cultural differences that you weren't prepared for or any kind of challenges that you just weren't prepared for? Well, I recall in high school in my junior year, I took French and didn't pay attention and I failed. 
Little did I know, and a year and a half later, I wish I had known French because I was in French North Africa. But uh, it certainly made you appreciate what we had in this country. Uh, when uh, I saw uh, Arabs uh, in Philipville and Azu and eating uh, what we threw away, what we wouldn't eat today, you know, sure. uh, you can appreciate. Uh, where we were and where we came from. So you saw a lot of poverty and starvation over there? Well, there were those that were hungry, yes. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think the natives ever had too much. We ate well, and the you know, American people were forced well taken care of. Mm. Were you able to keep in contact with your family at home at that time? By mail, mm -hmm. by mail. Were you completely honest with what you were seeing, or did you just sort of what types of letters would you send home? Just general information on what we did and what we saw. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't write everything because it was uh, censored, you know, mm -hmm. censoring took place. During the evening on the ships, was, were there blackouts on the ships? The ship was always blacked out always. in the evening, mm -hmm. always. And during your time off, what did you do to, other than rest, what did you do to while away the hours? Well, there were those who uh, played cards, there were those who played dominoes, uh, I had, uh, as a cadet, I had to uh, maintain my studies. We were given certain uh, studies we had to take care of, and they had to be submitted when we came back to the States and approved and, uh, or disapproved. <laughs> so you had by some... By our superiors. You had some schoolwork, basically, yes. to oh, do, yes. that's even what though we're you were for. on the ship. Yeah, that's what we are there for. Did you maintain any close friendships on the ship? No. Mm -hmm. No, when we hit the port, we got back to the States, everyone dispersed, except for the cadets, and they went uh, back to, uh, I think it was uh, Kings Point, and uh, were assigned to the second vessel. We, we, you had to, as a cadet, you had to put in at least six months sea service at that time. Mm -hmm. Some, uh, some guys had to stay longer because they, uh, the ships went elsewhere and some people were torpedoed and uh, never got home, you know. Mm -hmm. 142 of them never came home, as a matter of fact. Did you have some close calls then? No, not to my knowledge, mm -hmm. no. So did you come back after the six months uh, at sea? About six, six and a half months. And then I uh, took advanced training at Kings Point and I left there of my own volition and went into the Navy. And at this point, what was your, for lack of a better word, your title in the Navy? What rank were you? When I went in the Navy, mm -hmm. I went in as an enlisted man. So then did it sort of start over with another new ship? Well, I had, I went through what every uh, uh, boot does in the Navy. I went through boot camp at Sampson. I uh, took gunnery practice at uh, Fort Pierce, Florida, uh, Fort Pierce, Florida. I went to electrical school at uh, Detroit, Michigan. Uh, I was assigned to a uh, an LCSL in uh, Portland, Oregon. And can you explain what an LCSL is? An LCSL was a uh, gunship. We built about 150 of them, I believe. They were. Uh, they had rocket launches on the front, and uh, they were only 160 feet long. And we took that down to San Diego, and from there they needed an electrician on an LSM, which is another different type of landing ship. Mm -hmm. And that's where I spent the rest of my time on an LSM. And where did that take you? On so did you feel like, before you answer that, I'm sorry, did you feel like your boot camp and some of your training was almost redundant. You had done that before, or oh, yes. was, was a lot of it even more updated than what you had experienced before? No, no, it was, a lot of it was redundant. Mm -hmm. But that but, was okay? Oh, it didn't ever bother me. You're always willing to learn. Mm -hmm. So when you were put on an LSM, um, how many others were on your ship? We had uh, 55 men and I believe four officers. And where did it take you? It took us to the, all the islands, uh, Pearl Harbor, Honolulu, the Marianas, uh, Russell Islands, uh, the Philippine Islands, 
Okinawa, and Korea. What was that like for you? Well, we, uh, when they, we went over there to, uh, I think it was at Pearl Harbor, they, uh, they put uh, pontoons, they uh, used uh, steel pontoons, and we took those to, uh, as I recall, we took those to Okinawa. We arrived at Okinawa, uh, I think it was 12 or 13 days after the initial invasion. We stayed there about uh, 10 days. And during that time, we uh, put the pontoons in the water. Uh, at night, we would, uh, we'd, uh, uh, we had big smoke generators on the stern. We would make smoke around the uh, major vessels to protect them from the suicide sh uh, speedboats that the Japanese were using at that time. They were using speedboats at this point. Uh, well, we call them speedboats. I'd, I'd really say they were motor launches, mm -hmm. and they had hundreds of them. And they would put a 2,000-pound bomb, I believe, on them, as I recall. And uh, they would try to uh, ram the vessels with, uh, with those uh, speedboats. So they were not only using speedboats, but also we, we have heard historically about the airplanes. Oh, the kamikazes, would... oh yes. And so your purpose was to smoke screen the larger ships? Yes, and we, we provide uh, firepower also. We had, uh, we had a twin 40 on the bow, we had uh, four 20 millimeter holocorns, and we had seven 50 caliber machine guns. And the 50 calibers were put on, as I recall, uh, strictly for that because the other guns uh, they couldn't be depressed far enough to uh, to the water's edge, where a 50 caliber, you could, you could, you could really uh, come quite close to the, uh, to them. So you were in the thick of it right after? Well, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say we were in the thick of it. There were those who were in the, much thicker than we were, you know. We weren't there at the initial landing. Uh, we put, moved some Marines around at different shore points. And our uh, captain did what he had to do, and then he got us out of there as quick as he could. So did, did your group sense a difference, not only of purpose, but of fear also between your trips to North Africa and your trips? I, I don't, I don't you know? think so. You were trained, and you knew what to expect, and, mm -hmm. and you knew what you were there for, and, and we did what we had to do. And how long were you at, at all these islands, outer islands? Oh, we, uh, we'd move equipment around from the town of the Russell Islands. And <laughs> we moved troops around. Uh, when we, uh, after the war was over, uh, we went to uh, Korea. That's when we wound up in uh, Jinsen, Korea. During the Korean War, they called that, that Jinsen was the Korean name. Uh, during the Korean War, that was uh, called Incheon, which most people know of. And we, were, we brought in the uh, occupation forces and their equipment. And we were there because the uh, big ships, the transport ships, could not come in close enough because of the tides. Mm -hmm. So you would take some of the marine, uh, Marines and others well, we, off the larger ships, put them on yours? Well, we didn't have Marines. We had Army. Army. We had Army, yes. Army and their, uh, all our equipment. Were you able to share any kind of stories with any of them, or? Well, there was a lot of swapping going on. The guys, some guys were interested in swapping for war souvenirs and uh, firearms and swords. I was never too interested in that stuff. I... What about any humorous things that might have happened during this difficult time? Well, you know, <laughs> the only humorous thing I can think, think of that happened to me was uh, I believe we're in the Russell Islands, and uh, one of the, uh, they put six or seven of us, uh, the ships on the beach, and it was in the uh, early morning, early day, in the, late in the afternoon, and then a couple of the guys got on the beach and were roaming around, and they found uh, an amphibious duck farm that's similar to the duck that you see running around in Boston Harbor now. 
and uh, a couple of motor Macs got that running and brought it back and uh, all the guys would, uh, not only us, the officers, other crewmen, other ships would run it out into the water a couple hundred yards and run it back and we had nothing else to do, just fooling around. So this is like the flat bottom duck boat oh, you're yes, talking about. Oh yes, exactly, okay. yeah, it's flat, it has wheels on it and it has a prop in the back. And they uh, it conked out, but we left it there. Uh, later on in the day, uh, one of the gunners mates who I knew well come up and said, uh, Stan, there's uh, some small electric motors in the engine compartment. Why don't we see if we can get those and we'll put them into our, uh, into our living quarters? Which seemed like a good idea. So he and I went on with some tools and we were banging away removing them. And a couple of Marine Shore patrolmen, military police, came along and, What are you guys doing? We told them, Yeah, okay, and let's, uh, where are you coming? That's our ship there. What's your name? And we told him, and the guy says, that's so? He said, let me see your dog tag. And I knew when he checked our dog tags, we were in trouble. And I, this guy, the other gunner's mate, his name was Tabor. He came from Connecticut. And I said, uh, Tabor, you better get your gear together because they're going to come back and get us. And they did. Uh, they took us to the, uh, the brig. I'd never been in a brig in my life. I was scared to death. And Tabor, he was mouthing off, and the Marines were very unhappy with us. And uh, in the morning, every time I'd hear a ship's whistle, I figured, there goes my ship, and they're going to leave me in this island. But our captain came up and got us. And the reason they, uh, they uh, arrested us, if you will, was that the uh, admiral on that island, I think his name was uh, Russell Kelly Turner, uh, had a horse, he used to like a horseback riding. And the men were stealing vehicles and riding them and leaving, dumping them where they were. And someone stole the Admiral's horse and ran it to death. And he said, the next guy is caught. And that was us. Oh. But uh, the captain, uh, when we were out at sea, the captain took everything and he destroyed it, forgot all about it. How long were you in the brig for? Overnight, but it seemed endless. It was in the next morning, they were behind us with, with shotguns and, oh my God, what an experience. Never forgot it. So with all the dangers of war, it's because of simply taking some electrical parts that you end up getting probably the fear of God put into you? In all probability, yes. Just trying to be a good guy, you know, and keeps the other guys cool. While you were um, on the ship or at any of the different um, docking areas, did you have the ability to hear about other aspects of the war in different parts of Europe or North Africa? Yeah, we hear, we got the newspapers, I believe. Were they newspapers or newsgrams? And it came over the, the radio, Armed Forces radio we had. Uh, we received mail. That was not, uh, we were well informed what was happening. When did you think that things for you were going to start winding down? Were you committed to a certain number of months or? No, uh, I think we were kept there as long as they needed you. Uh, when the war was over, uh, the men went home on points. The more senior guys went longest, went home the quickest, which was the fairest way. And explain points. Well, as I recall, they got it, you got points for uh, uh, years of uh, years of service. Uh, I think you got points for uh, being in certain areas, and I think you got points for being in in uh, any. Uh, military operations, as I recall, but I'm not really positive. Do you remember what it was like when you were short of time and getting ready to leave to go come back to the States? Where were you? We were, uh, we were in, uh, I think, Korea. Uh, I'm pretty sure it is when we heard that Roosevelt was, uh, had died. I was that before, I've forgotten. Um, no, I, I, uh, I don't remember really. 
When you heard that Roosevelt died, what was the sense of you and your group? Terrible. That was a, uh, the worst piece of news I think we could have got. What was the feeling for him as president at that time? I cannot ever remember anyone that I served with speaking badly of him. I think he was a, a very beloved president. I, uh, he was quite a guy. So once you got back to the States, was, uh, you think it was from Korea? Oh yes, we went from, uh, we left Korea and then we went to, uh, I'm pretty sure, Pearl Harbor. Everyone stopped at Pearl Harbor before they came back. From Pearl Harbor we went to uh, San Diego. When you were in Pearl Harbor, you could still see the effects of the bombing? Uh, no. I don't recall seeing any of that. I think in, by 44 when we got there, I'm pretty well sure that was pretty well cleaned up. Mm -hmm. But when you were in those areas, were you able to have shore leave where you could relax? Yes, yes. When we were when we were in Honolulu, uh, Pearl Harbor, they, we got on the beach. We were lucky enough to swim at Waikiki Beach, where they now spend all kinds of money to visit. Uh, we stayed in the in the Royal Hawaiian Hotel where. All the skivvies and the, everything were hanging out the windows drying. <laughs> yeah. And we drank uh, a lot of pineapple juice. With? Uh, oh, with, well, I was just pineapple juice. I was never too much on the, uh, anything other than that. I think what I uh, missed most was cold milk. Really? Oh, yeah, milk was, uh, some guys might have wanted a cold beer, but I'd want a glass of cold milk. So when you came back, you came back through San Diego? Yes, we came to San Diego. Uh, we were losing people on our ship from through points. Uh, then uh, they took us uh, through the canal, uh, up to Mobile, Alabama, where we, we uh, were going to decommission the uh, LSM-125. And then from Alabama, did you take a train home? From Alabama, from Mobile, I went to a naval hospital in Pensacola. I had some surgery. Uh, I had only a short time left. They sent me to uh, the receiving station in Boston, the Fargo building. And I uh, was there, I think, 10 or 12 days living on shore and subsistence and quarters, and I was discharged from there. Now, the surgery that you alluded to, was this war-related? Uh, no, I was not wounded. Mm -hmm. So then you're out of Boston, and you went back home. Your family knew you were coming home? My family at that time were in uh, Mount Vernon, New York. Uh, they, had, they had gone there, moved during the, uh, during the war. Was this because of your father's business? Yes. So then did you go to Mount Vernon? No, I never cared for it. I, uh, I stayed in Boston and lived in Boston. And then what? After the service, what did you do? Well, after the service, my father had a dental laboratory in town, and uh, I went to work for him for a few years. I met my wife, who was a Natick girl, and that's how I came to Natick. How did you meet her? I met her at the Archbishop Cushing Horse Show, which is no longer in existence, I believe. When you came to Natick, which, as you said, was 40-something years ago, what was it like back then versus now? Well, Natick at that time, and I was uh, certainly not a townie, but uh, it didn't take long before you knew everyone on the main street. and. You could greet people, and uh, the merchants were uh, altogether different than they are now. Credit was extended, and no one ever pestered you. You paid them when you could, and it was, uh, it was more or less the honor system, and I think it worked out well. What about Route 9 at that time? Route 9 was, uh, I think we're where the Ming Garden is now, 
uh, 9 and 27 was a, uh, a chicken restaurant of some kind. Uh, there was a drive-in theater where Sears is now, uh, where the cloverleaf is. I don't, the only thing I can recall there was uh, there was a motel and a gas station. And the later on, they built a complex of offices on the opposite corner. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, Carling's came along. Carling's Brewery. The brewery. And then I think, uh, I think it was in the 50s that uh, the Saloos built a driving range in the early 50s. But Natick was a quiet town, you know, a nice, nice town. And still a nice town, you know, it's a nice town. It's a little busier. Well, there's more activity, let's put it that way, you know. Looking back now on your military life, how do you feel, how important do you feel it was, and how, second part of that question, how do you feel it affected the rest of your life? Well, I always felt that uh, military training was good for, for any man. What about for women? The women uh, in the military, well, I remember uh, they had waves, uh, they, had, um, they had the wax, and I think at that time they were just getting women Marines, and they also had the spas. As a matter of fact, I, I recall when I, uh, I lived, uh, when I was living on shore and subsistence and quarters, the waves had their uh, headquarters for their, for their young women in Brookline on Beacon Street. I've forgotten the name of the building, but that's where those ladies were. But I always thought they did one heck of a job, then and now. Knowing that you feel that it was important to serve, how did it affect you, say, discipline-wise or maturity-wise, um, having been in the military at a young age? Well, the best way for me to answer that, I think, is when I married and I uh, was fortunate enough to get a job in the local post office. And we were only out of the military four years, I guess. When the supervisor told you to do something, uh, we did it, and we never questioned him. I noticed that has changed considerably. We never questioned uh, authority. And do you think that back then, because you did it, because your boss asked you or told you to do it, do you think day-to-day -day operations worked better than they do now? Well, in most cases, I think so. In most cases, as long as the, uh, the order was a uh, legitimate order, I, I never had any question to uh, question it. So you mentioned working at the local post office here in Natick? In Natick, yes. And how long did you work there? 32 years, 8 months, and 15 days, including my military time. And you retired from the post office? Yes. When? January of 80, 1983. <clears throat> One of the questions that we ask a number of the veterans before closing is, your feeling about the difference of opinion of the public towards members of the military during World War II versus those in the Korean conflict and those in the Vietnam conflict. What's your sense on that? Well, World War II was a popular war, if you want to call it that. We were, uh, Korea was uh, Again, I think the country was behind it. Uh, Vietnam, I know that the, uh, there were many in our country that were opposed to that, and we certainly had plenty of internal strife because of it. But the reception that the Vietnam veterans got when they came back from the American public, uh, they should be ashamed of themselves. The public? The public should be ashamed of themselves, absolutely. Do you think that's changed at all over the last number of oh, years? Oh, yes. No question about it. 
I myself went to Gloucester two years ago to see the Vietnam Moving Wall, and uh, it was quite an emotional experience. I went to see it because I knew a couple of the young men's names were downtown on that plaque as boys from when I was a letter carrier. Mm -hmm. You got to know some of these yes. young men. Yes, yeah. Uh, in finishing up, is there one thought or comment or sense of feeling or memory that you'd like to leave us with, not only for your family, but for those who may be viewing this tape in the future? Well, uh, I would hope that uh, the people in our country today and those who follow us appreciate what we have here, because when they get, to, and if they should ever get to any of the other foreign countries and see the way people uh, live and are treated, men, women, and children, it uh, makes one really appreciate what we have. We, I know we have our problems, and we probably always will have, but it's still the greatest country around. We'd like to thank you this afternoon for a nice interview, and thank you for coming. Thank you for having me, Mrs. Craig. I appreciate it. Okay.